Welcome to part two of an uncivil war. At the end of part one, the town of Leicester was surrounded by almost 11,000 of the King's finest cavalier officers, their royalist troops and half a dozen siege guns. Meanwhile, behind the town's hastily constructed and repaired defences was a force of just over 2,000 men, most of whom were civilians, not soldiers. Against these overwhelming odds, the people of Leicester were about to feel the full wrath of the Royalist army, as the town became the focal point for the entire English Civil War. I'm Jim Butler, welcome to Hidden Histories of Leicester. There are numerous accounts of what was to become known as the Siege of Leicester, some of which contradict others. The account I'm about to give is based upon the latest research of eyewitness accounts, official reports, archival material and archaeological evidence, all gathered and interpreted by Matthew Morris of the University of Leicester's Archaeological Services, to whom I'm extremely grateful. And so it was on the morning of Thursday the 29th of May 1645, the main body of the Royalist forces led by the King and Prince Rupert swept around the east and the south of the town. The majority of the soldiers camped on the slopes of St Mary's Fields here, overlooking the town. Meanwhile, Charles I's main body of horse cavalry quartered themselves at Aylston. However, this is not to say that the Leicester garrison simply stood back and watched from behind their defences. Throughout the morning, there were a number of skirmishes between the Royalists and Captain Babington and the garrison cavalry, which successfully delayed the King's troops establishing gun batteries aimed at the town. In the afternoon, Lieutenant Davies, one of Major Innesy's dragoons, successfully led a charge out of the eastern defences and down the Melton Road, managing to drive the Royalists back to the bridge over the saw at Belgrave. But there were more pressing problems at the town's northern defences. So let's go. Unfortunately, either through lack of will or lack of time, the town corporation hadn't completed all of the defences commanded by Parliament. This included the instruction to clear away any buildings outside of the defences that the enemy could use to aid their attack on the town. Spotting this error, a number of Royalist snipers took up position in the buildings just on the Woodgate side of St Sunday's Bridge, north of the city, where they began taking pot shots at the town's defenders who were positioned just the other side of the river. Here the Royalists remained until Major Innes, with 20 of his dragoons, sallied forward from the defences and drove the snipers off. The dragoons then taught the nearby houses along with St Leonard's Church, which had stood beside the river for centuries, all to prevent the snipers returning. Now let's go south. Despite the best efforts of the town's defenders, who continued firing on their enemy with muskets and light cannon throughout the day, the Royalist forces continued to secure their positions, especially towards the south of the town. It was somewhere close to this spot near the present-day Jarham Street that, in the late afternoon, the attacking force started constructing two batteries of cannons, aimed directly at the Newark's south wall, which stood about 200 yards behind me on Bonners Lane, just the other side of the Queen Elizabeth building. Once these works were completed, with the exception of sporadic gunfire, a tentative silence fell over the town. For the people inside the town defences, Friday the 30th of May was a day of two halves. In the morning, nothing of significance happened. No doubt the Royalist troops made good their positions and checked their arms and weapons, whilst the garrison and Leicester's remaining residents anxiously watched and waited for the inevitable attack. Then, shortly after midday, the silence was shattered as Royalist cannons fired a single volley across the town, formally marking the start of the action. Shortly afterwards, Prince Rupert sent a summons to the militia committee based here in the Mayor's Parlour at the Guildhall ordering the town's surrender. Immediately, Colonel Sir Robert Pye and Major James Innes, the two most experienced parliamentary soldiers present, recommended the town's surrender. Unfortunately, 
As Pai and Innes were outsiders, the town council chose to ignore their professional advice and prevaricated. Instead of answering Rupert's demand, they sent a messenger asking for permission to defer, giving an answer until the next morning. Perhaps they were still hoping for reinforcements from other local parliamentary garrisons. They also requested the Royalists not raise any more batteries of cannon in the meantime. This, despite the fact that Rupert could clearly see from his position the townspeople continuing to reinforce the town's defences. Rapidly losing patience, Rupert sent the messenger back, exclaiming that if he returned with a similar message, he would be placed in the stocks. But still the town council debated, sending the same poor messenger back to Rupert, again asking for more time. Perhaps unsurprisingly, the messenger was not seen again. Instead, Rupert now sends his own messenger, demanding a response within a quarter of an hour or face the consequences. At 3pm, over two hours after the original summons had been sent, and with the town council still bickering about what to do, Rupert began his bombardment, opening fire on the Newark. By 6pm, despite a lucky shot taking one of the Royalist cannons out of commission, a large breach had been made in the medieval Newark wall, which ran down the line of Bonner's Lane here. In a desperate attempt to shore up the breach, three cannons were relocated to the Newark to cover the break in the wall, and then the men, women and children of the town began gathering wagon loads of wool packs and other materials and built a breastwork behind the breach, all through the constant exchange of gun and cannon fire. With the evening drawing in and perhaps recognising the fact that the Leicester garrison had by now been awake for three days with very little rest, the Royalists make preparations for a final assault of the town. As night falls, the Royalist forces are split into four divisions and a reserve unit, with the idea being to thinly spread the small number of defenders around the whole length of the town's defences and overwhelm them. Accordingly, Lord Astley positions his division to the north, Colonel Bard to the northeast, Colonel Russell under Prince Rupert to the southeast, and Colonel Lyle to the south, facing the Newark. It appears that very little attention was given to the west of the town due to the difficulties in crossing the river and the marshy terrain around it. At midnight, a thunderous volley of cannon is fired at the town, signalling the attack, and the Royalist forces simultaneously assault six or seven places around the defences. Unsurprisingly, the Newark was the scene of some of the night's most brutal fighting. The first Royalist assault on the breach in the Newark walls was an utter failure, as the defenders unleashed their cannon on the attackers. The Royalist, Colonel St George, who is said to have bravely led the attack, soon came face to face with one of the defensive cannons before being shot into small parcels, along with a large number of his troops. However, this defensive victory was short-lived as the Royalists redoubled their efforts and swarmed into the breach, driving the defenders back into the Newark. But this first foothold in the town by Royalist troops would not last long as the attackers came upon the second defensive line the townspeople had made from wool packs. From the flanks, Captain Hacker's cavalry descended upon the Royalists, attacking them furiously, whilst Major Innes' dragoons formed up and together expelled the attackers from the Newark back through the breach. Over the course of the battle, the defenders in the Newark would successfully repulse three more major attacks. But things weren't going as well elsewhere. Follow me. Close to this spot, the junction of Charles Street and Belgrave Gate, Colonel Bard, a formidable commander who had already lost an arm in battle the previous year, led an attack on the Belgrave sentry with 250 men, attempting to overrun the walls using ladders. But 16 of his men were killed, including a Major Bunnington, who was shot through the head as he reached the top of the ladder. A further 60 were wounded, including Bard himself, who was struck down with the butt of a musket, and the rest were compelled to retire. However, on his next attack, 
Colonel Bod gathered a large number of hand grenades that were thrown over the walls, wounding the defenders and forcing them back long enough for the Royalists to scale the walls and lower the drawbridge, allowing the mounted troops in. Almost at the exact same time and using similar methods to Colonel Bard, Colonel Russell takes the Gallow Tree Gate sentry. At this point, the Earl of Northampton's cavalry starts stampeding through this whole area, roughly between Charles Street and Gallow Tree and Belgrave Gates, cutting down every defender they can find, to the point where it was said that more defenders' bodies were discovered against the inside of these walls than anywhere else in the town. Such was the sudden ferocity of the attack. Whilst fighting raged in the east, Lord Astley launched two assaults. The first across St Sunday's Bridge at the North Mill, close to Frog Island, and the second across a bridge near to the Abbey. Perhaps due to the fierce fighting to the east of the town, the assault with just three ladders close to St Margaret's Church by Colonel Page's Infantry Regiment was completely unopposed. Upon hearing of the trouble to the east of the town, a Colonel Theophilus Grey the Governor of Leicester and a distant cousin of Lord Grey of Gruby hastened to the area. But by this point the enemy were too numerous and Colonel Grey and his men were forced back off the defences and into St Margaret's churchyard where they made a last stand. In the ensuing fight Grey was severely injured by two sword cuts to the face and a pike wound in the back. Eventually he was surrounded by the enemy before being taken prisoner by the Royalist, Major Trollope. By 1.30am the defences had been breached in several places. The garrison had been overwhelmed and Colonel Russell's men had hoisted Prince Rupert's Black Ensign flag over the main battery at Horsefair Lees. However, by no means did this mean the fight was over. The surviving soldiers and townspeople now sought to defend their town, street by bloody street, with whatever they could find. For over an hour, the Royalists were made to fight for each step of ground they took. Not only did the garrison attack them in alleyways, shoot from hidden places and fight them through St Martin's churchyard and the surrounding streets, but also the women of the town unleashed their fury on the attackers. Numerous reports claimed the townswomen shot at the Royalists from upper windows, threw scalding water over them and rained down slate tiles from the rooftops onto their heads. The people of Leicester, it would seem, would not surrender easily. But it is here at the High Cross, the very heart and centre of the town, that the Leicester garrison makes its final stand. Led by Captain Babington, the garrison succeeds in pushing the attackers back but soon the Royalist infantry arrive, along with some cannon, which succeeds in pushing the defenders back towards the Newark, which still hasn't fallen despite being under constant barrage. Realising they are now surrounded on all sides, the remaining defenders agree to surrender themselves as prisoners of war, on condition of personal safety and exemption from being plundered. By sunrise at about 3.45am on Saturday the 31st of May, the Siege of Leicester was over and the town was now in Royalist hands. Over 700 people and hundreds of horses lay dead or dying in the streets, with countless more injured. However, for the people of Leicester, arguably the worst was yet to come. Throughout history, Victorious warriors have plundered the homes and lands of their defeated enemies. This is a sad but true fact of war. However, what was to happen next in Leicester following the siege of the town was soon to be held up as an example of human barbarity at its worst. Even though Leicester had formally surrendered, the tenacity of its defence, which came at a great cost to the Royalist forces, unleashed a violent revenge upon the town's survivors. Even though the surrender of the remaining garrison had been on condition of their personal safety, upon emerging from the magazine gateway, the town soldiers were beaten and robbed by the Royalist troops. Some second-hand reports also claim that a number of the town's committee were hanged and others were cut to pieces, but evidence for this is lacking. But as the soldiers were gathered up and led away, it was the civilian population that was to feel the full wrath of the vengeful Royalists. 
Because of their spirited defence of their families and homes, the troops went on a vicious rampage of the town, attacking not only the men, but also the women and the children. To quote one account, Leicester became a den of robbery, rape, wanton destruction, murder, pillage and outrage. Every home, shop, tavern, warehouse, church and hospital was looted and plundered as increasingly drunken soldiers filled their pockets and lined their stomachs. By the end of the day, the entire town had been utterly stripped of every item of value, most of which was loaded onto 140 wagons and sent to the King's stronghold at Newark in Nottinghamshire. To literally add insult to injury, the town leaders were then ordered to pay the King a further £2,000 in compensation. Following the battle, Charles himself is said to have rode through the town, resplendent in his bright armour. Upon seeing the atrocities around him, committed by his troops, he is reported to have said, I do not care if they cut them three times more, for they are mine enemies. Furthermore, in a letter to his wife, he wrote, I may, without being too sanguine, affirm that since the rebellion, my affairs were never in so hopeful a way. In the space of just 48 hours, the ancient and proud town of Leicester was reduced to ruins, not just physically, but financially and spiritually as well. It would take decades for the town and its people to recover from the devastating events of the 31st of May and the 1st of June, 1645. But the immediate impacts of the Siege of Leicester on both the Royalist and Parliamentarian forces were to have major ramifications for the entire English Civil War. Within a matter of days, the tide of the war would turn. Troops from both sides would be marching across the county and Leicester, once again, would find itself under siege. Join me soon for part three of Hidden Histories of Leicester, an uncivil war. Thanks for watching.